Well, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to a very special evening tonight, Leading Voices in Public Health. Uh, this particular evening began about a year ago when we got a phone call from the Hope Through Healing Hands Foundation, which is Senator Bill Frist's organization uh, that supports health improvement programs around the world and had supported uh, a, the Frist Global Health Scholars Program at, at uh, the College of Public Health. And they said that they had a donor that wanted to support a similar type of program in Appalachia. And so we thought, well, perhaps we're qualified for that. And I was extremely pleased to learn that the, the donor was Big Kenny Alphen. I think like all of you, I knew his public persona, but I came to know his private persona as well. He's someone who's been significantly involved in a variety of humanitarian efforts. When he learned about the uh, situation in Darfur, Sudan, he went over himself to make sure that he knew what needed to get done. Then he supported it and he went back to make sure it was getting done. He's followed up after the earthquake, I think, with two trips to Haiti. He's also supported a variety of programs domestically uh, for women and children, and particularly with environmental issues. Uh, I, th I think, as you all recognize, he's following in a, in a long tradition of entertainers who use their voice not just to entertain us, but also to educate and to lead us. Uh, it maybe goes back to Woody Guthrie, all the way up through Bono, through Cy Khan, Eric Vogel, whoever your favorite musicians happen to be. What impresses me most about him is that someone that can have a big enough talent to be a true music star also has a big enough heart to be a true humanitarian. So please join me in welcoming a real leading voice in public health, Big Kenny. That's the first time I've been introduced by a professor. Thank you. And a dean, too, yeah. I will put on the guitar because I seem to be more comfortable these days with one of these. And, um... Oh golly, in the late, in the late uh, 80s, uh, a great tragedy swept across the United States. It was called uh, the Savings and Loans Scandal. Scoundrel. It was some scoundrel who decided he was going to cheat people out of their money in savings and loans. It closed down banks all across America. Saw it on the West Coast, swept from one end of the country to the other. People lost, by the, by the thousands, lost jobs, lost homes, lost everything you can think of, just like what just happened here the past couple of years. Crazy thing about that <clears throat> is, uh, well, during that time, uh, being raised a farm boy in Culpeper, Virginia. Actually, I guess uh, that's how I would get a title like uh, a rock and roll farm boy. <clears throat> being raised a farm boy in Culpeper, Virginia, um, that. I, uh, one day on a job site when, when the construction industry had fallen apart, a friend of mine uh, came up to me and he said, Kenny, you're singing all the time. He says, you ought to go to Nashville, Tennessee. I hear they pay people to write songs down there. And I looked at him as I set down my 26-ounce S-wing framing hammer. I looked at him and said, you've got to be kidding People get paid to write songs. Well, that was one of the first times in my life that I'd been down to my last dollar. And then one of the second times in my life came in about 2002. Uh, I moved to Nashville in 1994. And in 2002, once again, after going through years and years of trying to uh, become great enough on my instrument, my voice, my abilities as a writer that I would aspire to have some sort of success or greatness and aspire, remember that word, some sort of greatness as a, uh, a performer, a songwriter, that <clears throat> uh, as, along those ways, I, well, I still ended up eating beans a lot, but at least I had beans to eat. And uh, one time I ended up out in uh, 2002, Los, I was in Las Vegas. 
I actually had a friend that said, hey, Kenny, why don't you come on out here and celebrate New Year's Eve with us? We're going to see the um, a big show that night. And, and they, they bought me a plane ticket. I appreciate that plane ticket. And because that morning at about 5 a.m. in the morning as I sat on the edge of my hotel bed, I was, knew I was going to be coming back to Nashville having to pay my rent that month. And I had nothing. I had a couple hundred bucks. Well, I had a couple hundred bucks a few hours before then because I'd taken that couple hundred bucks to a blackjack table <laughs> and thought that maybe I could take that couple hundred and turn it into, you know, a couple hundred more and I'd have, actually have enough to pay my rent. Well, lo and behold, I got it up five or six hundred bucks, man. I was really doing good and you will not believe what happened next. <laughs> I lost it all. Oh, yeah. I went for it all, but I lost it all. I had a dollar. I had a dollar chip left. And I went to my room. went up to my room. As I pushed myself back from that blackjack table, I said, I better take this. I might need a little something to get started over with. And uh, I took that to my room and sat on the end of my bed. I went to take my boots off as I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do now? What a terrible place to be at, you know? So think, what am I going to do now? So I did like anybody would do, man. I went to take my shoes off, and I went to pull my boot off. At that time, the heel came right off the bottom of my boot. <laughs> what What's going to happen next? I said to myself, what's going to happen next? And as I said to myself, what's going to happen next? I just kind of flopped back on the bed. And I said... <clears throat> Everybody say, ha, 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 ha. Y'all help me out. Ha, 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 ha. You can do it louder than that. Ha, 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 ha. Come on, it's a free show. Ha, 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 ha. Well, my friends are always giving me watches, hats, and wine. That's how I know this theory. Yes, that's how I know it's time. That I don't have to worry about the things I don't have. Hold me back and one, two, three, like a bird I sing. Cause you've given me the most beautiful set of wings. And I'm so glad you're all here today. Cause tomorrow I might have to go and fly away. Fly away. I should go from Happyville, from Happyville to Haiti, Sudan, and ETSU. <clears throat> from Happyville to Loveland, old Big Kenny gonna tour from coast to coast. But I'm leaving everything behind. There's not much that I need. Just when I ain't got nothing, that's right. I'm foot loose and fancy free. And one, two, three, like a bird I sing. Oh!
and dream of angels and sunshine, rivers of clean water, place for every kid to lay his head. Changed the mind and readied for this rocket ride. Miles of space and colors of blue. Through no fears, light years of new. Turquoise and laughing and tears of joy and lights of love. We must employ the edges soft. Can come undone. The rhythm's right. The world across every county line, across every state line, across every country line, across every river, across every creek, across every stream, across every ocean, skipping across every pond, across every continent. The world is one. Everything that I do, every voice that I speak right here, right now, I know can be heard everywhere. If somebody would just put up a big enough PA, come on, give me some amplification here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with y'all tonight. I do not consider myself a public speaker in any way, shape, or form. But that's no excuse for me to not stand up here, so I'm not going to let it stop me. <clears throat> I do consider myself a singer, and a, a, an artist, and a creator, and a performer, and a farmer, and a... Well, I'm just a, a believer in, in everything good. I'm a believer in things that, all, uh, that, that ain't so hot today can be a whole lot better tomorrow no matter what. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer in life. I'm a believer in life, love, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think another great Virginian said that his name was Thomas Jefferson. Yeah! Go Thomas! Uh, he, he actually uh, holed himself up in this place about 30 miles from where I was raised. It's called Monticello. In about two weeks' time, he wrote a document called the Declaration of Independence. Any of y'all ever read that? Goodness gracious, can you imagine writing that in two weeks? Come on! So if he can write something like that in two weeks, then the least I could do would go see the movie Spider-Man. <laughs> now you may ask yourself, what's the relationship between the two of those? Well, the least we can all do is live our lives. And in living our lives, I fully believe that we should enjoy them. We should go to lots of concerts, especially come to lots of Big Kenny concerts. <clears throat> um, because in, uh, in, in seeing those, we're, we're going to live our lives. We're going to always learn from every experience we go through. The experience I saw at that Spider-Man uh, movie, I uh, was... Um, Telling Mr. Wyckoff here uh, earlier, we were speaking uh, as uh, Spider-Man's uncle had been shot by the bad guy. He's uh, laying there in his last breaths as, as Spider-Man, the, the young Spider-Man. I don't think he was wearing his outfit during this scene, though. His uncle says to him, "Too much to those given much, much is expected." That rings in, in me over and over. Because I guess I've always just couldn't stand to see anything suffering. And everywhere that I go, and I, as, I, as my travels have become broader than outside of the county lines of the the place that I call home of Culpeper, Virginia, that really as a child I didn't really dream or see any need to travel any further than the county lines of Culpeper, Virginia. But as I've traveled past them, I've seen that <clears throat> even though we had definitely had some tough times growing up on that farm, that my father taught us to always provide 
for ourselves and to not only take care of ourselves, but to always have enough to give to your neighbor, too. That means if you're raising tomatoes, any of y'all out there, then I expect to have some tomatoes, you know, come tomato season. Uh, <clears throat> so there was always a, a, a land of plenty. Well, then, you know, I, I stepped out of that, outside of that and into the big world and, and uh, and in the pursuit of my own uh, happiness, it, it took me in, in many travels here and abroad. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's moments like this that I also realized that I ought to have cue cards and, and preparations for, for his, uh, talks and speeches, but uh, I'm really not much on that either. I just uh, speak from the heart. and. Uh, my heart's always uh, seemed to speak to me louder than anything else, anything else I've ever heard. Um, it, it speaks to me sometimes, it just puts words in my head. Mahatma Gandhi, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, what were they thinking? What's the most anyone can do? Well, my friends, that's up to me and you. We could be a bit like Robin Hood. We could even get the bad for good. And we could surely have ourselves a real good time if one of you out here knew how to make the water wine. <laughs> like that other guy did a couple thousand years ago that people have been writing books about forever. But imagine the heart that it took for any one of those men to continue the journeys that they were on. Mother Teresa, Lordy have mercy. I mean, the, the places that woman would go, the people she would sit down with fearlessly is absolutely amazing. So, God, I've got a thousand stories and I'm trying to think of which one to tell you in what order so it'll make a little bit of sense. But the little bit of sense is this. <clears throat> is I, uh, I, I know that we've all been uh, giving much, given much, because we're here today at our own free will, number one. I have witnessed oppression in this world. Uh, in 2004, 2005, uh, when I finally found some success in the music business, with that success some people decided that, well, maybe I could help with some things. Uh, one of the things that was shown to me uh, was uh, the situation that was going on in the middle of uh, Sudan. Some of the pictures that were shown to me were pictures that I would wish no one to have to look at to even have these visions in your head. You know, my child wakes up, he woke up yesterday, he's four years old now, and he says, Daddy, Daddy, he was disturbed, I saw a one-eyed monster. I said, really? Did it look like this? Ha! <laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah. I said, well, you go and you just butt that one-eyed monster right in the chest and tell him to go away. So he certainly did, he slammed me right here. And, uh, I, I, kind of, uh, I kind of saw that monster myself, but I wasn't four years old. I was at that point in time now almost, or I guess around 40 years old. Uh, I was, uh, it, uh, had become a, a new, I found love in my life. I knew I was going to have a child. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted this new love in my life. And uh, about that time, people showed me some pictures of uh, some of the devastation that had been going on in uh, Sudan. The pictures were enough to open my eyes and make me uh, want to have to learn more. Because something in my heart just wouldn't let me go. And said, wow, you've, you've got more than you know what to do with now. What are you going to do with it? Well, I, I saw, I saw uh, pictures of, of, of children that had been treated like animals. Um, I saw pictures of young girls who had been bound together, gang raped and burned alive. You know what I realized? The house I was raised in, in Culpeper, Virginia, I'm the seventh generation to be raised in that house. That house was used as a hospital during the Civil War. During the Civil War in this country, in lands that you and me walk over right now, these same instances occurred. It could just as easily be me. It could just as easily be my family. And 
I have this great realization from my father that the more good that is put into the world, the more goodwill that is put into the world, the more chances there are that if it should ever be me who needs a, a hand up, that there would be someone there to help me. And these people just needed someone there to help them. Someone to just go over and sh maybe shine a little light and say, life's not supposed to be like this, y'all. Wake up! So in my, uh, in my uh, trying to do that, and this is a story in and of itself that I could go on for about five hours on, but uh, anyway, I ended up running into some more people, uh, a group called My Sister's Keeper, um, uh, which were a bunch of nuns out of Boston, Massachusetts, as I was funding uh, speakers to just come tell people like y'all to just make audiences aware of some of the atrocities that were going on in other neighborhoods around the world. Uh, I had experienced 9-11, uh, as we all know that one was a, a great oppression happened somewhere in the world that made some people so angry that they rose up in such a, an, an, uh, a dark and hurtful way that, that they, they, they were able to cross oceans and attack, and attack us the families, I'm sure, of people who are in this room right here. That, that it, it so made me aware that, that anything that I do here would not only affect my health, well-being, and safety, but would uh, affect the health, well-being, and safety of everything that was around me. And anywhere that I went and, and planted uh, seeds of, of hope or of uh, or. Of, of just any kind of goodness past, past what some people have to live in, that it would, it would, it would possibly mean that that would, that would be somewhere where people wouldn't be so angry and oppressed that they would rise up and lash out like that. And one of these great cases at that, at that time, and still, it was just one of the most horrific that I had seen anywhere in the world, was in Sudan. So having, um, I met this uh, lady, my sister's keeper, <clears throat> uh, again, nuns out of Boston, and they had an idea. They'd met a, a gal who'd, who'd fought in the, the, uh, the, the wars, which had been going on. Uh, we knew of a civil war that happened in America that lasted some five or so years. This has been going on for 50, 50 years since the mid-1950s. The country had been battling against itself, and this great oppression had happened to these people and I had, had, uh, I had seen these pictures that made me want to do something but I knew that I had to make sure that everything I was seeing was right. That, it, that I had to do my due diligence and in doing my due diligence I, uh, I, I went there. I just decided I was going to make the journey. I made the journey um, and um, I took everything I could. 23 cases we were able to carry, me and my wife and a, a friend or two that showed up to help. And we were able to get there and see this and inspire these, uh, and help these nuns that were working there to help build a school for uh, girls that were, were showing up under a tree every day because they had a chalkboard they could nail the tree. And when it wasn't raining, teachers would show up because we showed up with some cash to pay the teachers. They had no buildings. Most of the people that were in this area um, were just survivors of a war. So people who had been pushed out of their, their neighborhoods and villages and had landed in this area and found it a bit of a safe haven because the World Food Program had shown up there and put, a, put up a tent and had grain to offer them. Uh, the World Health Organization had shown up there. and. Uh, and told them, showed them how they could immunize their children so that they wouldn't be dying from, if they weren't dying from war, they were dying from malaria, measles, cholera, whatever, you name it. Um, <clears throat> so many, uh, it, it was just, it was, it was more than I could ever imagine. In a million years that people actually live like this, in a, in a place that I'd known had so much, had, had such plenty. So anyway, we stuck with a plan, and um, to make a long story short, I ended up back over there again this year. So it would have been 2007 to 2009. Uh, this time, uh, I went back with... Uh
with uh, three uh, planes and about 18 people. One, one, uh, one, uh, one plane had uh, doctors and teachers and stuff like that in it to assess the community and help them in any way they could. Another plane had um, medical supplies in it. At that point in time, they were dealing with a terrible cholera outbreak. And we knew if we took salt water, it could save a life, meaning uh, intravenous fluids. Uh, and then another uh, plane that had everything to fit uh, a school out, because we now have four buildings up and 550 girls are registered in a school in the middle of Sudan. It is now in a, the village of Akan. It's called the Kunyuk School for Girls. And uh, these girls who've never had an, uh, well, half of them were bought out of slavery, actually, $33 a piece. Um, they now have a school they can go to. And uh, they they're, seem to be really glad to have it. Matter of fact, they were so glad when the planes landed, it was like a parade going on everywhere. And they actually gave me these, this necklace right here. So where? That's what I got. But how about a hand for 550 girls going to school? In the midst of doing that one week, uh, you know, I've been traveling. I'm busy as a man can be now because I'm also, with the success comes, like, everybody wants you to play, right? So 75, I don't know, probably about 75% of the year I'm on the road traveling, going places and, and playing, save all, ride a cowboy, or ride anything you want to, uh, <clears throat> or Chevrolet or whatever you ride. And, uh, but one, in the midst of my travels, my dad called and he needed me to help him on the farm or something. And, Today is my dad's 81st birthday. He's still tending that farm there in Culpeper, Virginia. And uh, he asked me to come up and help him with something. And there was no way we could get up there in the bus in the two days that I had. My bus driver, Bobby, who's here with me today somewhere, he, uh, he offered up his, he's a, also a pilot, and he has a little Piper Cub. That's a little itty bitty plane. For any of you who know anything about planes, it's so itty bitty that I sat in it like this ee, the whole way from Nashville up to Culpeper, Virginia, and it, and the thing would hardly ever get up more than about a thousand feet off the ground. <laughs> like Bobby, are you sure we don't need to stop and tighten this rubber band up? I had never flown the way a crow flies. I had never traveled from Nashville, Tennessee to Culpeper, Virginia like that before. I'd always traveled uh, well, by highway, uh, 40 to 81, or I'd flown in a plane, which is 30, 35,000 feet up in the air. Most of those big old jet airliners are. So in traveling like that, wing over top of the hill and dale, I, I saw some of the most beautiful neighborhoods, I've, I've, just small towns and villages I'd ever seen, some pristine rivers, creeks. And then wing over another hill, I was like, what is that? And the next thing, I was just like, it looked like a war zone, just thousands and thousands of, of acres just completely right in the middle of the most, of the deepest forested Appalachia just blown up. And then I'd see a, you know, a beautiful river, and then I'd see one that was green and then a lake that was black. I'm like, what's going on here? I had never seen this. So it, it, I kept, as we kept flying, I kept seeing more and more and more. It seemed like it wasn't going to end, and then finally it ends. I get to the farm, help my dad. I come back, and I couldn't get it out of my head. I was like, what is this? I started researching online, and uh, come to find out that we as Americans, uh, we in the, in, the, in the United States of America have been blasting down um, the mountains of my beloved Appalachia, the Blue Ridge, whatever you want to call it, uh, the home of the Appalachian Trail, uh, where I hope to hike with my child, my four-year-old one someday, um, that we've been blowing down our mountains because we found that it was cheaper to get the coal out that we need to power our light bulbs. This is an aside. I hate to do this, but I've got attention deficit disorder. Terrible, man. So I can carry on about 15 conversations at one time. But I just read today, Bobby, my bus driver again, he goes, Kenny, you ever heard of anything about this bloom energy? I'm like, what are you talking about? Bloom energy? What do you mean? Like flowers making power? 
because I'm thinking, you know, we, I just packaged my new CD, The Quiet Times of a Rock and Roll Farm Boy. I packaged it in, in a compostable sleeve that if, even if somebody threw it away, it had seeds in it perennial wildflower seeds and that it would grow uh, you know the, even if somebody threw it out their window that it would grow a start a prairie of wildflowers and anyone that knows anything about perennials as my mother and my father and my grandmother and all them taught me that you know you put them in the ground one time man and they just keep going and keep going and, and keep going which is the essence of you put you start with any plant any seed of something good and it's going to proliferate into more good. And each of us has the ability to plant a few seeds, especially if you just go out and buy the quiet times of a rock and roll farm boy and sling it out your window. <laughs> Dr. Wyckoff, where was I? Which one? Mountain top removal. Oh, so I started researching online. No, 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 this, 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 this side was this. Uh, so Bloom Energy, I, I read uh, there about a box about the size of this. And I've been researching for years now because I just want to figure out how to be self-sufficient. I've just always liked that theory about this box. Well, actually, a box the size of about this stage that I'm on in a fuel cell technology that we have today would produce 400 kilowatts. That would be enough to probably power the uh, ETSU easily. I don't, I don't know. Any, you got any electrical engineers in here? <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I'm an electrical engineer. <laughs> nah. Uh, 400 kilowatts, that's a lot. Um, 99 square miles of solar panels at the efficiency that we're building them today in this country would power the entire country. And of course, you have to transfer, you have to move the power over a grid. But it, it, my point is that there are these solutions out there right now that allow us to, um, in, a, in fuel cell technology, it emits, no, it emits nothing but water. There is no byproduct other than, than uh, with the clean things that we use here uh, in, a, in our daily lives. But in what I discovered in my research of the exhuming of coal by blasting mountains down, some people call it mountaintop removal. I call it hell. It looked like hell to me. <clears throat> when I went on the, I went back. I said, I got. I have to go find out what this is. I went. I, I, I flew back to. I flew into Charleston. I got in another small plane. I went up flying around with somebody that knew the area. I said, show me this. What's going on? One of the first things I saw was this, another big lake. The water was black. I mean, like six, they said it was over six billion gallons of water in here. And, and what's, what, was, what I understood is what, what clean coal is, is cl to clean coal really means clean coal. You blast the mountain down because it's cheaper to blast it down than it is to mine it. So we blast the mountain down. And uh, you take all that rubble with the dirt and the coal in it, and you push it into a pond of water. Add some chemicals, the coal floats to the top, and all the dirt and heavy metals, lead, selenium, mercury, all that kind of nasty stuff, uh, floats down into the water. Well, now we've got all this water, and you know, if, when it does, when it rains, it pours. So the lake's going to fill up, and water's going to flow as I remember from my days of construction and plumbing, uh, hot's on the left, coal's on the right, and crap don't flow uphill. <laughs> so a lot, of the, a lot of something that's pretty nasty is going to keep flowing downhill. Um, so then I go on the ground and I start riding around some of these neighborhoods and go into people's houses and talk to them and turn their faucets on. Their tap water was black. Kids were sick. Neighborhoods would be collectively sick. And I didn't know about this. Here I'm 40 years old and I didn't know this is happening in my beloved Blue Ridge Mountains, the Appalachia, the home of bluegrass music and the home of some of the best moonshine that's ever been made anywhere. <laughs> I don't care what your reason is. Point being, we all deserve clean water. I found that in, in my research in trying to figure out what was going on here that the, what we do then is after we exhume, to get, exhume the mountain to get the coal out or blast the mountain to get the coal out, 
and, to, and then we clean the coal by washing it with this water, which then we got to do something with this water because it's, water got to go somewhere and you have to keep making, getting more water to clean your coal with, that we drill big holes. We drill big holes. We are this, this is how smart we are. We drill big holes back down into the ground because we've got all these old mine shafts, right? Uh, where we used to have people that mined underground. We drill big holes down in the ground and we pump all that water back down into the ground. And then we proceed to blast again about another 250,000 tons of diesel fuel and nitrogen a day. There was a, I guess one of the greatest ter acts of terrorism committed in our country on American soil. Buying American was the uh, um, health building there, a state building, whichever it was in Oklahoma City. Uh, that building was blown down with uh, diesel fuel and nitrogen, just basic old farm nitrogen. Now all of them have a place, you know, but in the water, in the air, in the environment, I don't see that as a proper place. When I've also read that 99 square miles of solar panels that will power the entire country or uh, a fuel cell the size of the stage that I'm building on would power this entire uh, college. Then I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I'm seeing these kids who are sick and suffering. I saw a school at the bottom of an impoundment that, w that was about, you know, a, a Big lake. I mean, this is a big lake, and it's and the dam is built with rubble. It's not even built in a way where it's going to stay there for a while. I haven't been in the construction industry. I've built a few dams in my life, believe it or not. And uh, I, I know how you do it and how you don't do it. I know this is not safe. Uh, we have seen and reading in the papers how um, uh, some of these impoundments have imploded, and and all this stuff flows downhill. So once again. Just like them gals that I saw over there in the Sudan, and those kids, those babies. I couldn't believe what these people did to babies over there. They, and having just had a child, I guess this is where it just... Phew. They... Oh. There is absolutely no reason for us as a country to be contaminating our neighborhoods, our water, and our environment in such a way. It is no different to, for, for us to contaminate the water that our children drink than it is for these very cruel men around the world who might take a child and snap it against a tree like a snake. There's no difference. It's just your method and your way of doing it. And I just can't see any need for any of it. Matter of fact, I see absolutely no need for any of it because we could all be planting tomatoes and planting flowers that just grow by themselves if you just love them a little bit. We could all be stewards of our land. We could all care about our neighbor and thus our neighbor's caring about us. There's no need for... Uh, there's no need for, uh, for... for us to even think like that. There's no need for us to live like that. There's no reason for there not to be a world where only good proliferates and where we would discuss amongst ourselves when we see problems and such issues like that. What I realize is these people in these communities weren't even discussing it. It wasn't an option. Fathers thought that if they weren't blowing the mountains down they weren't providing for their children. But no one had helped them to understand that in providing for your child, you were blasting this mountain down, which is cracked an aquifer, where clean water has been coming for centuries for you and your families and your children. You're pumping this contaminated water back down into the ground. It's mixing all together. And neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood is sitting on top of this water. And they're pumping it out of the ground, taking showers in it, Less more drinking it. It's drinking poison. 
you just slowly poisoning yourself. In the 70s, I remember uh, a public service announcement that would come on TV all the time. Well, there were several of them I remember from that decade. What a good decade. I also love 70s rock and roll, by the way. Go Queen! Yeah! And uh, in the 70s, it, said, it was this song. The paint is peeling from the ceiling by my baby's bed. Eating paint and plaster, took him to the doctor. Convulsions, lead poison, ghetto malaria. Why, Lord, why did my baby have to die? Well, then it was, we, were, we had lead in paint, in house paint, regular house paint. A mother would push a crib up against the wall. And, uh, and because these old buildings and old apartment buildings and a lot of people didn't, weren't necessarily taking such great care of them, the paint chipping off the wall and the baby's sitting there eating it. All of a sudden the baby's dead and the mother's going, what happened to my child? Well, man, I couldn't stand nothing to happen to my boy. So that means I can't stand nothing to happen to anybody's kid. And if there's something I can do about it, as easy as me standing up here in front of you and instead of just singing songs that we can all laugh and sing to, but to tell you the truth, then I'm going to do it in the effort that it could just, that could be my child. One of these children that, that I've seen that's drinking contaminated tap water, that could be my child. And my child is drinking it just because it doesn't know any better. Because dad said, this is okay. Mom says, we're lucky to have this. That's not acceptable. It's completely unacceptable. And for those who have to not rise up and say it's time for a conversation, then that's completely unacceptable. Why? Because I was also raised by a very simple motto that over time, as I, as I had time as a songwriter to sit around and think about it a whole lot and narrow it down into as simple a phrase as I could possibly make, then I determined that simple motto should be something like, this, because I love everybody and I believe that our world, our neighborhoods would be so much better if we all just followed one rule, love everybody. I narrowed it down into a simple mission statement, which was to highlight the good, to inspire greatness, and to encourage mutual responsibility for the betterment of humankind. That means it's time we have a lots of conversations. I didn't even realize that it was just the simple act of conversations until uh, Dr. Wyckoff here, um, the Professor and Dean uh, said in a conversation we had earlier, why have we stopped talking? What are people afraid of? There's nothing to fear but fear itself, man. And I ain't scared. I am not scared. You know what I just saw? I just witnessed Mother Nature go, ah, rise up and the ground imploded. And we weren't trying to get coal or nothing. It just said, hey, today's the day. Quarter of a million people. Quarter of a million. 250,000 people dead in one city. That city's Haiti. That happened on January 12th. Since then, I think we've had at least a dozen more earthquakes. That earthquake was so heavy. There's no way. I mean, we don't, we might think we got some nitrogen and some diesel fuel to blow up something, but I promise you, we cannot blow it up to the essence that Mother Nature can. It hit so hard, I understand that actually it, 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 it threw the, the Earth's orbit off its axis a little bit and our years are shorter by 0 .0013 milliseconds. Your GPS, any of you that have GPS? Pay attention the next time you go to a location. See if all of a sudden you aren't off by about 50 feet and go. You'll probably think, my GPS is broke. Uh-uh. Let it remind you. Mother Nature reared up. So I realized because one of my dear friends uh, had been down in Haiti working 
for the past decade, he traveled, oh, at least 50 countries a year. Uh, he had... Uh, he had gone to help people one time in the end of the 90s and just realized, wow, what a, what a great thing I can do. There's nothing better than to, than to, than to help someone. Um, that he had, been, he had been to Haiti, I guess, you know, he, he would be there every year. Um, when I met him in 2007, he'd been there about a half dozen times. And his goal was to put up, speaking of public health, his goal was to put up a light bulb to make sure that every rural health clinic or every health clinic, wherever it might be, have the ability to have a light bulb up. Because without a light bulb, if a mother might come to a, a clinic at night uh, with, a, let's say, a breached birth. That's a little baby right there. Look at that. Well, sometimes little babies get all or come out like me kicking and screaming and stuff and they might try to come out sideways or backwards and uh, it doesn't happen so easily and they need a little help. Well, you can't really do much if you can't see. Um, my uh, child falls and uh, you know, is running, playing, falls out of a tree, breaks his leg. You've got to put it back together. You can't do much in the dark if you can't see. An appendix ruptures. Anybody ever had an appendicitis here? I did when I was like 16, it hurt like hell. Oh God, if appendix ruptures, well the only thing you can do, it's gonna poison your body unless you um, can remove it. Um, you need a light bulb. We take for granted, I took for granted, and I'm not standing here as a, you know, I don't, I'm not standing here saying that I haven't made my share of mistakes in life and don't still do it. I'm just saying I've seen it, and I'm not gonna make the same mistake twice. Without a light bulb, nobody, you can't, a doctor can't help someone who's in that kind of a situation. So, on uh, January 3rd, my buddy Walt writes me a letter. Now, Walt is one of those rare individuals that uh, just really uh, realized in his life that it wasn't about him no more. It was about um, it, was, it, was, it was about more than that. And uh, on January 3rd, he wrote me a note. <clears throat> I'm going to back up a little bit here to go back to 2007 again. Is everybody still following me? Or am I losing you? You still with me? I'm just treating it like we're in a family room here, and I'm just a bunch of friends sitting around, and I'm telling you stories, right? So 2007, I go to, to Sudan to find out whether this really could happen, whether everything I was seeing was the truth, whether it was really worth trying to take my last dollar and turn it into a school. And... Uh, uh, so, in the midst of doing all that, my career is blowing up at this point in time. And uh, it, it seemed like, I, you know, I wanted to go here and, and help and do one thing, and everything around me wanted to go on the road and do more tour dates. Well, I'm going, oh, I can do that and do this too. And, and um, well, the, the long and the short was I got down to like the last week and, and nobody would help me. And I'd, already, I'd made a commitment, I'm going to do this. Well, so I started searching around. I'd seen this movie during a film festival called Beyond the Call. It had this gentleman in it by the name of Walt Ratterman. So in that movie, it showed that he knew how to like, power up anything anywhere like, and knew how to communicate. He was a satellite phone. So I knew I was going to be going into an area of the world that was a little unstable at the time. And, uh, but my heart kind of led me there, said, you're going to do it no matter what. And being that it has total control over me, then I was just, okay, here I am, I'm going. Well, I didn't have any help. I get down to the last week, and I don't have a, a fellow that said he was going to help me to put this stuff together. Just backed. He just said, uh, well, anyway, he, he uh, didn't show up. So I called this guy, Walt Ratterman, and I said, I just need to know now, if you can explain to me what I need to get to power a satellite phone, because I told my, my wife that we would at least, I would make sure we build a call home and tell everybody we're okay. And made a promise. I made a promise to my parents I'd do that. And since I'm a man of my word, I had to figure it out. 
Well, I called Walt, and how do you do this? Because I saw you do this in this movie. He was a very nice man. He talks to me for about a half hour, and he asks me everything I'm doing and, and uh, tells me everything I would need. And I think he could tell in the conversation that I was a little overwhelmed with putting all of these plans together because I was taking the nuns with me. I was responsible for them also. Uh, you're traveling into a country where um, not only is it a little bit difficult to get visas, but actually the State Department says you're not supposed to travel there. <laughs> so, uh, but I knew I had to, to go. Walt's telling me everything. I'm explaining to him what I'm trying to do. And he's like, when are you leaving? I said, I'm going next week. He goes, hmm, how are you getting there? I said, I'm uh, going to be traveling through uh, New York, and I think we're connecting London, then into Kenya, and then I've got a couple planes chartered that are going to take these people and, and all this gear and uh, survival stuff. We're going to keep people alive. And, and he goes, hmm, and, and how long, and what are the dates? And I tell him, and he goes, well, how about if I just, if I just come help you? And I'm like, you do that? He's like, well, I, I just got back from Burma. I've got a couple weeks before I'll be going back into Haiti. So, yeah, I could meet you if you want me to. I'm like, dude, that would be like the greatest thing. You know, thanks, I can't imagine. Well, I get into Nairobi and he shows up. Uh, go on BigKenny.tv and you can actually see the story of him. And actually when we were there at the airport and he had brought all this solar gear, he had brought a couple suitcases of it and everything that we would need to power up cameras and everything to tell this story. We get into the, to the, to the airport, I had carried 23 cases, you know, military sized cases of, of aid and musical instruments and books and medical, everything I could get. He carries two suitcases, and of all those 23, 23 cases that I had, one of his two suitcases doesn't show up. As we're waiting and waiting and waiting, he turns around and says, well, looks like we'll be doing a little shopping in Nairobi, because he had the solar panels. Well, he was able to, to go out that night, find everything we would need that he could rig something together to get us power the next day. And he went on the trip with me, helped us to have a very successful trip. Uh, at that point in time, we were also able to stop um, since the first plane, one of the first planes I'd gotten, uh, the cowling flew off the right or left wing once we were about 15 minutes up in the air. So we had to turn around with that plane and get another one. Well, the only plane they had was bigger. So we stopped and filled it up with more stuff. The more stuff were at that point in time were survival kits. A survival kit is a burlap sack uh, that was had a, like a, a cooking pan, a jug to carry water in, a tarp for shelter, a little bag of beans and a sickle knife for to cut down some reeds to maybe make a shelter or something. We were able to take 300 plus some of those in there and people are pulling, pushing out of a war zone so that's enough to keep them alive and to build shelter until they can figure out to do a little something better for themselves. But the big thing is, this guy showed up. He didn't know me from Adam. He, he you know, I introduced myself as Kenny. He, he'd been traveling the world. He didn't know who Big Kenny was or Big and Rich or any of that kind of stuff. He just knew that that's what he did and he was going to go help people. So I couldn't believe that I end up in Nairobi and this dude shows up. So needless to say, me and him become pretty good friends, right? Yeah. Wouldn't you be pretty good friends if somebody showed up like that? Yeah. Wouldn't we all like to have a friend like that? Yeah. So, um, about two months after we got out of, got out of that trip, me and him, well, we became pretty good buddies. And I'm talking to him one day, and that's, said um, the whole time we were there I could tell man he was just he was something was wrong he was hurting <clears throat> it's about two months later I called him and said Walt you ever you feeling all right now you, you getting better he says yeah you won't believe it I, they said I had malaria <laughs> he didn't even know it crazy I guess I tell you that because I want you to know how strong the human will is I want you to know how I, the strength that each of us possesses the ability that each of us has in us if we can just step past
past the cloud of fear. Fear is not real. Fear is the ultimate enemy. Fear, fear is just some ridiculous thing that keeps trying to put up a sign in front of us that says stop. When love is this empowering thing that continues to fill us up that says go, fear ain't real. Fear is that, fear is that black water that's got lead in it them kids are drinking. Fear, fear is everything that, that ain't, ain't good, and it's just a lie. So Walt and I, Walt Ratterman and I, become pretty good buddies over the next few years. We actually, you know, on the side, I found out that he's a, quite a piano player. And uh, we were always trying to hook back up and get together, but being that he's in about 50 countries a year, and I was in about 50 plus cities every six months. It was really hard for us to connect, but we always talked and emailed and just, you know, it was like he was a brother. Um, <clears throat> on the 3rd of January this year, I was, a, I got woke up on a Sunday morning, man, but just this overwhelming emotion, this feeling as I was thinking about these, all of these things that I've seen in the world, these atrocities that are happening, then I'm going, I can't be everywhere at one time, but what, I just don't know what to do to, to change this. I had to, I got, I had to, I, it woke me up 5 a.m. in the morning. I, I did what every good songwriter would do, just like I did in that moment with my last dollar. And I, and I, I, I got up. And I wrote it all down. And I wrote, I wrote the song. I don't know what else to do, so I'll just, I'll cry with you. I'll cry with you. A week later, I'm playing a charity event in North Carolina to raise money for a food bank. It was a room about three times this size, and it was packed wall to wall front to back, and believe it or not, people actually paid money to come see me. <laughs> it was so loud in there, I couldn't hear myself when I was singing, man. What a time we had. I had received this email from my friend. It's January... 11th, January 12th, Walt Ratterman writes me, Hello, Big K. He called me Big K. Just sitting here in Haiti trying to get everything done that we need to get done. And after your last note, I've been thinking a lot about you a lot. I hope you're doing well and your health is holding up. This business, both our businesses, can get pretty demanding sometimes. And, well, it's just damn tough, but it's good. As I get older, I get thinking there are only a couple things that matter much in life, besides family, of course. That is helping folks and music. I suppose that's why we got together. We got to do more. I keep promising myself as soon as I get some time not on the road, I'm going to get back into the old piano, maybe when my legs give out. Anyway, just wrote to say I hope your health is holding up. The world needs you. Take care. Walt. Walt Ratterman, Sun Energy Power International. I got this letter on a Monday. On a Tuesday, I'm in North Carolina playing that show. I got back to my hotel room, and I was tired, and I went to bed. The next morning, I woke up to find there had been an earthquake in Haiti. I immediately emailed my friend Walt back. I went to this email that he had sent me the day before, and I said, Walt, where are you? I didn't hear nothing. Got on my plane and I flew home. I called his wife. 
she hadn't heard nothing either. So I started working to get my ass down to Haiti to find my friend. Couldn't fly into Port-au-Prince, so uh, I hopped the flight into Santo Domingo, and, on, uh, which is the main city in the, in the Dominican Republic. I had some cash in my pocket, and I just started hitching rides until I could get to the Haitian line. Slept on a ground somewhere that night, got back up the next morning to cross the border, and hop in the back of a dude's pickup truck. A doctor pulls up, a uh, Dominican doctor, he says, Gringo, you, you cannot ride, what are you doing? I said, I'm crossing the border. He says, you cannot ride in that truck, you'll be killed. There was thousands of people pushing against the border at that time. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to be killed, I'm going that way. I got to find my friend. He, uh, you wait, you wait. Ten minutes goes by, pulls up with two ambulances, rolls the door open and says, put your gear in here, I'm taking you across. Well, he says it in his very Spanish accent, of course. And uh, one way or the other, I got there to where my friend had last been seen, which was at uh, the, the uh, Hotel Montana, which is about the nicest hotel where a lot of uh, government officials and UN workers and and the college students who'd go down there to work on missions trips and stuff like that, they'd all stay at this hotel. And that hotel had gotten hit really bad. And it, but Walt had come in from the villages where he was working because he had been asked to consult to U.S. aid on uh, some renewable energy development projects they were doing there. And he had shown up with his a project manager was working with him down there at 4.30. He was supposed to have a meeting with a a gal from USAID at 6 o'clock and at 5.30 a, a quake hit. And it wasn't just any quake, it was a quake that rumbled the world. By the time I got down there, it had been almost a week. Um, I was so lucky when I got on the ground, I was able to, I made a phone call and actually talked to my neighbor, uh, Dr. Frist, who helped me put together coming here today. He was already there. By the time I talked to him at 2 o'clock that day, he'd done 34 operations. Half of them were amputations. In a city of 5 million people, 90% of the structures were turned to rubble. <clears throat> and in most of them, as you drove down the streets, buildings that stood five stories high now were, were concrete slabs that were stacked on top of each other because the buildings just went <laughs> And everything that went in them was No longer. So I go there, and I find this is the last place he's been. I go to the Hotel Montana and uh, immediately see uh, Fairfax County search and rescue, Virginia boys, the number one search and rescue team in the world, first call in the world. United Nations calls them when there's a disaster anywhere. These are truly the good guys. We are the pirates of Cookie Town, Bohemian Vikings. We live with our likings and laugh when the sun goes down. Brothers and sisters of bravery, robbers of love, we live by the heart and the stars up above. We'll work till we all fall down. We're the pirates of Cookie Town. Just another aside. <laughs> but on that site, I met. Men just like those of VA, Task Force One, from eight different countries. Men and women that had come together all for one common goal, to save a life. Maybe just one life. The first morning I woke up on the parking lot, I was awoken by a man in an orange jumpsuit and a woman. She turned out to be a mother. The hotel set here and down below it set an apartment building that had also collapsed. I was sleeping in between them. This mother had watched <clears throat> as she held her year and a half year old daughter in her hands. She had watched the walls of this apartment building, four stories, crumble between her husband and her four-year-old son. This man that was with her, his name was Chino. He's part of a group called the Topos. 
They are Aztec Apaches. Most of them are old men. For the next five days, they work nonstop, 24-7, 365, with hand tools, with a hammer, with a, a claw hammer in their hands, laying on their bellies, trying to knock through rubble of cinder blocks and to get to that four-year-old boy. He'd come to me because they needed a power tool. They needed a, he was trying to describe a, a hilti, a, a power hammer that would help them to dig as they were tunneling. They needed 50 feet underneath of rubble that no, none of us, if you saw these conditions, you wouldn't go there. Nor would I even advise you to. But these men were going to do it. They were going to find that four-year-old. So as I sat there and listened to his mother tell me the story and, and describe to me her child, all I could think about was I got a four-year-old boy at home. And I would hope that somebody would show up if it was my boy, that somebody would show up if it was my child. So I found him a healthy hammer, man. And the Virginia Task Force One gave them anything else they needed to. Because we wanted to help. It's amazing. The amount of destruction that we cause on a daily basis in each other's lives. I'm as guilty as the next guy. When we could so easily be helping to empower each other so that no child would have to be snapped against a tree like a snake. That there would be a light bulb whenever a mother was trying to deliver a baby. There would be a, a light bulb for a doctor that was trying to <clears throat> repair a broken leg. That there would be clean water for anybody anywhere not just in the deserts and not just in these atrocious areas of the world where there is, there is no development there is no even knowledge of how do you contain water you are just learning how to drill a well but we know how to do it so how can we poison our children is beyond me it's unbelievable it's incomprehensible it's abominable I can't take it no more. I can't live with myself if I don't say something. Because I've been made aware. There are children suffering. I'm telling y'all. I'm telling every one of you. I'm going to ask you this. What are you going to do about it? And you can leave it all on a guy like me. You can leave it all on a guy like my buddy Walt. But we're only a couple guys. Now granted, there's a whole lot of couples out there, but imagine if everybody, everywhere, was always just going, brother, let me lend you a hand. Then everybody's lifting, everybody's giving, and there's nothing but good to proliferate. There's really nothing but loving everybody. It's a mindset. It's a switch that can be turned on or off. I'm suggesting we turn that switch on. Let's make a difference. You know how good it feels to help save a life? When I was 15 years old, I helped build and was a member of the New Salem Volunteer Fire and Rescue Department. When I was 15 years old, I pulled up on, I pulled my first living person out of a burning building. When I was 15 years old, I pulled up on my first accident where beyond the fault of no one driving the car in their lane, that another vehicle crossed the lane and a life was ended like that and shrewn into pieces all around me. I contend that at any moment, the exact 
same thing could happen to any one of us, me or you, driving home tonight. In 2002, leaving a gig, those were the days of the music mafia, the thing that even gave, one of the things that helped give me my career. Driving home one night, under no fault of myself, another car runs a red light, hits me dead on. My vehicle was totaled. My neck was snapped. Fortunately, there was a good doctor that had a light bulb, and he was able to screw my head on straight. <laughs> That's what I'm going to give my daddy this year for his birthday. So, Dad, all them years you've been telling me I should get my head screwed on straight, I finally did it. I think it's time we all wake up. I put a great burden on myself to sit here and tell you that. Because you can't speak it and not do it. I saw the greatest movement of American compassion that I've ever heard of, read about, or seen in my entire life in that first week in Haiti. I watched as the ship Comfort, an American vessel hauling All of the greatest technology that we have to save and heal life, to bring, to bring forth renewed health, is all of it was put on a great ship and brought to help these people. The ship Baton, carrying vessels that would haul four tractor trailers at a time, or hundreds of, of, uh, of, of workers or soldiers, of, of troops of, of, of peace and rescue. These ships will... These things will hover 10 feet off the water and go 90 miles an hour. The ability that we have is unbelievable. I contend that we could take all of that ability and solve 99% of the problems before they ever happen. A quake happens in Haiti, it kills a quarter of a million people. A quake happens of bigger, greater magnitude in Chile, it doesn't. Because we have the ability to build a solid foundation. The people of Haiti have been oppressed. The people of the Appalachia have been oppressed. The people of Sudan have been oppressed. There are people right here in your neighborhoods, neighbors of yours, that have been oppressed. There are women, there are men, there are children right here amongst us that have been oppressed. There are wives that are abused. There are children that are abused. If you don't stand up and do something, it might be you. It might be your child. If you do stand up and do something, you're part of the great wave that is going to change this tide of fear that exists in our civilization today. We're going to change this tide of fear. We're going to wake up and we're going to turn it around. We're going to solve the problems before they happen. We're going to realize that time is, it is time to change. Time's the man that changed the mind. And ready for this rocket ride. We're going to rise up. For any one of us, for any one of us, everybody in here would come a-running if you needed us to. For you, for you, for you. If you need me, I'll be there. And if I can't be there, everybody else around you is going to come a-running. We are the world searching. Right. We are the world task force. We are not in, only in our communities. We're everywhere. For the one come many, for the one come all, raise the souls of the living from the rubble that's fallen all around us. You can hear the cries for the one come many, many. We'll come and bring clean water, medicines, life. 
with many hands from many lands to help you through the night. And upon our backs we'll carry bags of beans and rice. And with you we'll find a place to rest our heads at night. Cause for the one come many, for the one come all. Raise the souls of the living from the rubble that's falling all around us. You can hear the cry for the one come many, many will rise. And everybody's gonna stand up, say stand up, say stand up, yeah, well, stand up for the one come many, many will rise. Come on, y'all. Say, stand up. Hey, stand up. Come on, stand up. Stand up. And many, many will rise. Yes, many, many will rise. Oh, oh, oh many, many will rise. But we gotta stand up. I can't take it no more, doggone it, and I'm not going to be quiet anymore, I'm over it. I'm going to sing songs and I'm going to tell everybody everything that I'm feeling, because I'm not going to carry this on my heart alone, and I'm not going to let you carry it on your heart alone. So I'm telling you all that I'm here to stand with you. And I know, because you're all here tonight, that you're all here to stand with me, too. And that feels real good. Yeah, I got a band. <laughs> yeah! <clears throat> so it's uh, with, great, with great pleasure, and, and uh, I'm, I'm very uh, proud to know that uh, the school here that... Um, <clears throat> Professor Wyckoff and Eastern Tennessee State University has, has stepped up to help me put together a scholarship program. It's called Aspire Appalachia. Because I believe we can all aspire to do better. It's easy, man. One foot in front of the other, one day at a time. And we have chosen uh, two applicants that will be receiving scholarships here tonight. And I, I'm going to ask... Uh, the professor, the dean of the School of Public Health, Sir Wyckoff, to come up here and help me. We've got some parting gifts for you, Kenny. All right. All right. All right. First of all, uh, this is uh, the Encyclopedia of Appalachia, which is a book that I think you're going to help us rewrite. So that's for you. Your very own College of Public Health portfolio to keep notes in, and the oh, College yeah. of Public Health coffee mug. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And then a, a very special and heartfelt recognition we're bestowing on you the status of humanitarian scholar in the College of Public Health. Uh, as they say, we accept you. And as he mentioned, the two scholarship recipients are here, uh, Jody Sutherland and Jenny Lunsford Hunt. Are they? Is Jenny still here? There we go. Yeah! Thank you all very much. We'll have uh, one more leading voice in public health, but I doubt the voice will be quite as good as the one you heard tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I took a little video with my camera phones and stuff while I was in Haiti the first time looking for my friend uh, Walt, and uh, I think they hooked it up where you could see it off the computer. This is a song that hit me on January 3rd, and this is uh, what I saw when I was down there. And uh, once again, man, to any, uh, any of uh, 
anybody who has family here that's in uh, the United States, um, um, I'm going to call them the Peace Forces these days based on what I saw. 23,000 American men and women in our armed forces showed up to aid these people. Tens of thousands more in, in uh, uh, other organizations like uh, Dr. Frist with his uh, Hope Through Healing Hands showed up of their own accord. I can't tell you how many people that I ran into that just showed up with a backpack on their back and they just knew they were going to go help. And I'll tell you what, as a, as, a, as a person of this country, I say, and as, a, and as a child of this world, that's just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. To know that that exists. Please know that exists. Please. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. From the bottom of my heart. I love you. I love you dearly. And here's the last, the best thing I can give you as a gift is a song. Here you go. Cry with you.